Okay, thank you for coming to the presentation. It's uh, Defending the Guard, Resisting Empire. So I'm Darren Wolf, and I work with Come Home America, which is a peace organization, a non-ideological peace organization. But let me get started with the Tenth Amendment aspect, which is what this is all about. Tenth Amendment is very much under attack, and it's been under attack for a very long time. For example, when I was in high school, we of course studied American history. We had the usual lesson about the debate between loose construction and strict construction of the Constitution. Now, just in case there are a few here who don't know about that, that is a debate as to whether the Constitution should be interpreted literally or used as more of a guide. In other words, should the Constitution be followed or ignored? <laughs> so when I said to the history teacher, well, why is there even this debate? I mean, doesn't the Tenth Amendment here dictate that we follow the Constitution literally? And his incredible answer was, yeah, that's not an important amendment. I don't know how he decided that, but he did. More recently, I spoke to a left-wing activist. When I say left-wing, I mean left wing. Uh, he told me that the 14th Amendment made the 10th Amendment irrelevant. He was referring to the provisions in the 14th Amendment that prohibit the states from uh, infringing on the citizens rights. Now, why would this be important to him? I think the answer to the questions I posed is that these people want the federal government to do things that the Constitution prohibits it from doing. It was because of concerns about the consolidation of that kind of power that the Tenth Amendment was put in place in the first place. The founders knew that a distant and centralized central government would be very dangerous. Now, part of the theory of republicanism, and I don't mean the political party, is that the states retain the power to govern internally. Once the feds usurp that power, then we, they open the door to all of the kinds of abuses that we see now. So today, I'm going to explore this issue in terms of the United States going to war. I'll talk, about, I'll talk about what the feds are doing wrong, why they're doing it, and what we can do about it. And at the end of the formal part of the presentation, then we'll do questions and answers. We'll have a discussion period. Now. The real enemy of liberty is government, especially an overgrown government. That's why the founders put the Tenth Amendment in place. Now, a good question to ask then is, what is an overgrown government's biggest ally? Hmm, it's actually James Madison that gave us the answer to that question. He wrote, of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. War is the parent of armies. From these proceed debts and taxes. And armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for bringing the many under the domination of the few. In war, too, the discretionary power of the executive is extended. Its influence in dealing out offices honors and emoluments is multiplied. No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. So the answer to the question of what is the overgrown government's biggest ally is war. Now in this quote, Madison used the word, he used the word emoluments. Don't worry, I had to look it up too. <laughs> uh, it means, um, right. <laughs> it means payments or special favors. Uh, I think in today's uh, parlance we might call it pork or favoritism. Now, no doubt war is expensive. It leads to influence peddling, <laughs> debts, and taxes. But there's another side to this, and that is that spending debts and taxes lead to war. Sometimes it become a question of which comes first. Now, there are a lot of people from many different uh, ideologies that want the government to do uh, all kinds of things. Yeah, most of them either unconstitutional or best done by the private sector anyways. Now they didn't start out thinking that there'd be any harm done by giving the feds a little more power and a little more money. So whether it's health care or gun rights, 
You know, what people need to understand is that the, the government with the power to attack Yemenis with drones has the power to take our guns here at home. A government with the power to attack Afghans with jet fighters has the power to impose the indoctrination system on us that they call public education. And that government, with the power to wage aggressive wars, to tax and create money, has the resources and the power to impose Obamacare on us. <coughs> Warfare abroad and welfare at home are flip sides of the same coin. <clears throat> We cannot give the government the tools it needs to oppress us and expect it not to do so. It's not enough just to advocate that they stop. We have to take away the tools they use to commit their evil deeds. And that means we gotta do a few things. One, and the Federal Reserve System, and the income tax, and the federal government's social spending, its regulatory role, its police powers, and its aggressive wars. Peace and liberty will only be ours when the government is powerless to commit evil acts, both at home and abroad. Ultimately, it is the fact that the U.S. has become an empire that leads directly to so much war. Now there are many, from the founders to serious analysts today, who have made that point. Sometimes people are surprised to hear that Patrick Henry made that point over 200 years ago. He's, most, he's of course best uh, known for the speech that he gave that inspired the revolution, give me liberty or give me death. Less well known is a speech he gave opposing adoption of the Constitution titled, Shall Liberty or Empire Be Sought? Now in this speech he, uh, he warned if we admit this consolidated government, it will be because we like a great, splendid one. Some way or other, we must be a great and mighty empire. We must have an army, a navy, and a number of things. When the American spirit was in its youth, the language of America was different. Liberty, sir, was then the primary object. But now, the American spirit, assisted by the ropes and chains of consolidation, is about to convert this country to a powerful and mighty empire. That was 200 years ago. Moving on to the present day, one advocate of the view that the, Amer the US has become an empire is George Friedman. He's the founder and CEO of STRAT4. That stands for Strategic Forecasting. This is a private global intelligence company that gives non-ideological analysis. Now he wrote a book last year, and it's titled The Next Decade. So what he's doing here is forecasting the geopolitical situation, obviously for the next 10 years. Now, I can't agree with his pro-intervention conclusions, but Mr. Friedman does make some great points in his book, and some of them are things that most Americans are unwilling to face. The major one being that the United States has become an unintended empire, as he calls it. Now, in the, in the next decade, he very passionately states that he wants the American Republic to survive the empire that it has acquired. Well, unfortunately, the Republic is already dead. Now, he points out that the Roman Republic was overwhelmed by its empire, and he doesn't want to see that happen here. But, well, it already has happened here. Now, we're not about to have an emperor crowned, you know, a la Julius Caesar. What we have is that the, the form of the republic lives on long after, after the reality of it has died. In other words, the Tenth Amendment has been ignored. The federal government has grown way beyond its constitutional constraints. One second. <laughs> One place to look to resist aggressive war is the state level. Now here we have a very long and honorable tradition going back to colonial days. Outside of New England, there was great resistance to the French and Indian War. It started back in 1754. Now to quote from a great book called The Civilian 
and the military. It's a history of American anti-militarist tradition. In Maryland, the militia law compelled service only in case of invasion. The assembly was cautious about voting funds for defense and insisted upon retaining exclusive control of all troop movements. Virginia's militia law, passed in 1748, stated that men could not be taken from the colony. So let's think about that for a moment. Wrong page. Yes, let's think about that for a moment. They made some great points about how men could not be taken from the colony. In other words, the militia could not be deployed outside of the specific colonies. Compelled service only in case of invasion. They're giving that as the reason why you can mobilize the militia and go to war. Retaining exclusive control of all troop movements. The colonies wanted to retain that power for themselves. Well, too bad the states don't do that today. Moving past the colonial period, the Constitution specifies when the feds can call forth the militia, uh, which today has been replaced by the National Guard. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 states, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. That's it. They give three reasons why the feds can legitimately federalize the National Guard. But I'd like to look at the issue of going to war in a little more depth. Another part of the Constitution states the federal responsibility to the states in terms of defense, which in my view is basically saying these are the only legitimate reasons why the federal government can go to war. Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution. In part, it reads, protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature against domestic violence. In other words, the Constitution is limiting the federal government to two reasons to go to war, invasions and insurrection. Well, given these constitutional restrictions, you have to wonder, why is the National Guard deployed and fighting overseas these days? It goes back to what was aptly named the Dick Act of 1903. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This really is the name of it. <laughs> Anyways, um, to quote again from the civilian and the military, Dick Act of 1903, which provided for calling up a portion of the state militia to serve as a National Guard under federal authority and pay. Later, in 1908, the Dick Act was amended to enable the National Guard to serve either within or without the territory of the U.S. Think back to what I said about the colonies not allowing men to be taken uh, deployed outside, how things are changing. Uh, then came the National Defense Act of 1916, which gave the President greater power to federalize the National Guard and provided for federal funds for it. Things are changing even more. But being able to call on the guard at will is no doubt what the founders would have seen as having a standing army through the back door. Today, it's one way to hide the true size of the military. Sounds like a good time for some nullification now, doesn't it? <laughs> well, that brings us to um, something that our hosts here at the Tenth Amendment Center are proposing. And this would allow the states to resist federal overreach it is the Defend the Guard legislation. This is law that they're proposing that each state legislature adapt. This is nullification at the state level. Uh, the summary for their proposed legislation reads as follows. For the purpose of requiring the governor to withhold or withdraw approval of the transfer of this state's National Guard to federal control in the absence of an explicit authorization adopted by the federal government in pursuance of the powers delegated to the federal government in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 of the U.S. Constitution. So in other words, they're saying the governors can refuse to turn the National Guard over to the feds or recall them if already federalized. Very definitely a good way to clip the feds' wings. So moving along to... Nullification also applies at the individual level. And in individuals, hmm, what can we do about the wars? Well, there is a peace movement. 
I'm sure that you're all just dying to go out there and join with the group that wants peace and socialized medicine. <laughs> no, of course not. No, forget about that. Uh, I've tried working with the left anti-war movement. Uh, few of them are really open to working with the liberty-minded anyways. But there is one group that deserves to be mentioned. That is Come Home America. Their website is comehomeamerica.us. As you can see, they actually named the, the book that this group is based on, comehomeamerica.us. This book is based on a meeting uh, that took place uh, with unlike-minded people. What brought them together was their um, concern for the runaway militarism taking over the United States. The meeting was held in February of 2012, no, 2010, included people from the right, the left, and the center. Was, uh, progressives, conservatives, liberals, libertarians, reflecting the views of many Americans, things that are not uh, seen uh, coming out of Congress, the White House, or the mainstream media. So our purpose is to have a peace movement, one that welcomes everybody, and one that makes everybody feel not only comfortable, but part of the movement. You know, nobody should feel like they're standing up for somebody else's political agenda when they stand up for peace. And that's why we have one focus, and that is ending the wars abroad. You know, we uh, really need to expand the peace movement. If it keeps on being a matter of the radical left on one side and the libertarians on the other, it'll keep getting the same dismal results it has until now. Now, in between the two sides is the great big middle. You know, the famous Joe and Jane six-pack. You know, they're not, they're not radicals. They may be Democrats, Republicans, or Independents. They may be uh, anti-war. But until now, they've had nowhere to turn. We've left them out of the peace movement. But now, though, with groups like Come Home America, they have a place to go to engage in peace activism. So, well, check us out at comehomeamerica.us. You know, join us at uh, the local group. And here in Philadelphia, we have a local group. Um, if you're from out of town, join your local group there. If there isn't one, then we'll help you start one. And I do have some extra copies of the book. For those who would like it, it's only $16.95. You bargain at twice the price. <laughs> no, you can see me afterwards if you like a copy of the book. Uh, before wrapping up, I want to go a little bit off topic here. But I, I'm very confident I'm getting into something that will go over very, very well here. I'm talking about the most important liberty event in Philadelphia. So after this one. <coughs> I'm talking about the best time you will ever have standing up for liberty. I'm talking about End the Fed. Yes, Rally for Sound Money Day. I had a feeling there wouldn't be any tomatoes coming in. <laughs> my way for that one. All right, so you're all invited to join us uh, on Sunday, April 22nd at 11 a.m. in front of the Federal Reserve Bank over at uh, Sixth and Arch. <laughs> April Fool's is to April Fool's is tomorrow, knock it off. <laughs> leap here, oh leap here, good point. Alright, anyways, where was I? I gotta start over. Um, oh yes, okay, so it's uh, April Sunday, April twenty second, eleven AM, six in Arch. Um, this is the end of Fed, I gotta say, this sets the standard for end of Fed rallies across the country. We're going to have the Renegade uh, Parade float. On that float is the Mobile Rock Show. Basically, that means Jordan Page. <laughs> now, after the end of Fed rally, and I have to emphasize this is a completely separate event. But after the end of the Fed rally, at 1 o'clock at Independence Hall is Philly Freedom 2012. There's going to be live music. Uh, there will be Jordan Page and Tatiana Moroz. I'm, I'm, personally, I'm not familiar with her. They tell me she's great. I don't know. But anyways, uh, there's also going to be speakers, including Michael Scheuer, uh, former chief of the CIA. Uh, chief, oh, he's former chief of the Bin Laden Issue Station at the CIA, Georgetown University professor now, written extensively about the issues of terrorism and peace. Now, here's, here's the good part, sort of. 
I have to emphasize this. There's a possibility, and again, it's not confirmed, it's a possibility that Ron Paul will be at Philly Freedom 2012. Who's that? Yeah, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> He's ramping his dash. <laughs> 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 right. So if you live around here, no excuses. You know, be there, please. And if you don't live around here, come back, because you don't want to miss this. Okay, now that I got away with that, let me close. I want to emphasize, you know, what brings us all together here, what, what motivated this libertarian anarchist to come here and address this crowd, is our need to oppose the enemy of liberty, the government. And that means, if not the goal of no government, at least much less of it. And just as I advocate for the peace movement, we need to put aside our differences and come together. We need to work to restore peace and with it, our liberties. So I'm wishing you peace and liberty. I thank you for being here, and now I'd like to open the floor to questions. <laughs> questions, comments? <coughs> Sir? Okay. I, I thought it was going to be more talking about uh, the National Guard. I guess the question is, I, I never served. I had a high number back in the day, and I didn't have to serve. Vietnam was going on at the time. So these people that are going, joining up, and I, and I you know, you sit by the end of the door so I can get out of here in case there's veterans here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, why do they keep joining up? They know these wars are unconstitutional. That's the only economy we have left. Okay, I, take it, I, take it, I take it everybody heard the question, right? Okay, so we're good on the question. Um, I, I would say, well, first of all, I'm actually a veteran myself. Um, so, but that was a long time ago, right out of high school, and I won't even go into how long ago that was. But anyways, uh, um, I don't think that people really know that the wars are unconstitutional. I mean, the government says that they're, they're perfectly constitutional, legal, and, you know, most necessary in protecting us from, you know, I could go on and on. I mean, a lot of people buy into that. Yeah, people certainly at 18 don't know they're, most of them going through the government indoctrination centers don't know they're unconstitutional. Right? Yeah, the, the comment was that most people, like, at, at a young age of 18, just coming out of the indoctrination centers, the schools, don't know that they're unconstitutional. They don't know the Constitution. They think they're doing something good for their country. It's like Top Gun. <laughs> that, and I think he's right about the economy. I mean, I've seen that in some of my own family. They're joining the military just to pay the bills. Because there's nothing else left. I have to see that in areas of the law. Yeah. 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 Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, 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 I think the, the point uh, the, that's been called the economic draft and uh, that is a good point. When you, you limit the economy the way it has been, what choices do people have sometimes? You know, if it's a choice between feeding, feeding the family or not, you do what you got to do. Okay. Also, um, I'm also a veteran. Um, one, you have, as far as economic incentives, you have a guaranteed job, a good paying job, a job that if you are overseas, it's tax free free college education. So, I mean, there's there's a, a lot of economic reasons. Also, you gotta think about, um, over the past few years, right coming coming out of uh, September 11th and everything, there's a whole lot of patriotic fervor coming out of that where you had a, a, had a rush uh, to enlist as well. So, I think that's probably subsiding a little bit, but for economic reasons, um, it's, you know, when, nobody, when somebody's offering a ten dollar an hour job and somebody else is offering forty grand a year in free education and health care and no taxes, it's kind of easier to get health care plan. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a shame that people have to choose between you know flipping burgers or killing people, but sometimes it does come down to that. Yeah. And, and one other thing is that with the National Guard. Um, up until just a few years ago, at least a lot of the people in my unit were not expecting, uh, were not planning to go. They thought they were, it was a state thing. It was, it was very, um, uh, there was a lot of controversy early on when they started getting deployed. It's now been accepted, you know, that that's what you do. Um, but early on when they signed up, they, they it's not the International Guard, it's right. the National Guard. That's good. It's not the International Guard, it's the National Guard. I like that. Um, 
Uh, see, I think you raised your hand next. Yeah. Um, do you have a sense of how uh, how far gone it is? Seems to me like uh, you know, this National Guard, as sort of a federal auxiliary force, is pretty has a pretty long precedent at this point. Uh, that means call, just the fact that it's called, I mean, a, a National Guard, but the whole idea of the nation and we're all one nation with one military and so on and so forth. Uh, do you have any sense of how hard it would be to try to claw those those troops back and put them under the command of the state governments? Well, uh, certainly the Tenth Amendment just proposed an idea. Um, right. You know, it's hard to say. I mean, if, if you want my personal point of view, if you look at the, what I talked about, the uh, the Dick Act of 1903 and the National Dick Defense, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. I mean, to me, it seems that they're contradicting the Constitution right there, but yet the courts aren't uh, aren't saying this. So, obviously, it's going to be difficult. I mean, you can get into the War Powers Act and how the Constitution already says how the U.S. is supposed to go to war. Why is there a War Powers Act that would seem to contradict it? Uh, so the answer, I hate to say, is um, it's going to be difficult. Do you to, think that's a good, play, a good place for the peace movement to, to uh, put its uh, put a focus on, on trying to get back the guard? I certainly see that as a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know that there's any one place we need to put all the all our eggs in one basket kind of thing. And uh, there's all different ideologies in the peace movement, so you know, people go different directions. Uh, yeah, with the attempt to bring back the national or the, the state guards back to the states, would that give them the, st the states the ability to then protect their own borders, particularly against immigration? New Jersey. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 is that, is that, is that <laughs> well, once, uh, did everybody hear the question? No. Did the, uh, uh, I guess I should repeat, close the border. I guess I should repeat the question. Um, if bringing back the guard would then allow the states to protect their own borders, uh, especially um, in, in terms of immigration or illegal immigration, yes. Um, why? Well, well, I would suppose that would be up to the different states. I mean, again, that's the whole idea of, of federalism: is that the states are governing internally. So the states would bring back their guard. It would be kind of up to them, and according to their own constitution and laws, what they do with the guard. Um, to be honest with you, I mean, just like with, say, marijuana, the states can legalize it, and the feds go in and, and arrest people anyways. You know, it's kind of hard to imagine a state passing the, the Defend the Guard Act and then saying, you know, okay, come home, and the feds aren't going to fight them on it. You know, that's why it goes back to the other, the other gentleman's question. It's, it's a difficult situation. For sure. Um, okay. So to, to follow on that scenario, I mean, have, have you guys played it out a little bit? What's going to happen? Well, the law is passed in the state of X that the National Guard is brought back into the control of the governor and the legislature, whatever. What are the feds likely to do? How is the, stand, is the state going to respond? What's, what's going to happen? Well, like I said, it's a difficult situation. It'd be interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah, well, what is likely to happen in Personally, I have the feeling that they could, assuming you can get the legislation passed, I really think that the feds will just fight it tooth and nail. What else are they going to do? Fight, fight what? Fight, fight the states trying to recall the guard. Physically stop the guards from coming back. Well, at least they would do so legally. They're certainly not going to issue orders to federalize troops and say, okay, you guys go home. It's hard to imagine that. So how is the state going to enforce its own law? If, if the National Guard is already federalized, it's under the direct command of federal military. Right. How are they going to physically get them back? Well, Raise that's a good question. I mean, it's a good question. How are they going to do it? I don't know. Do you have to get it back it? Yeah. 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 Uh, people, people, uh, gentlemen in the back. I had always had the belief that like the 17th kind of aided the states and losing their authority to dictate how the federal government, national power the federal government, for example, why you had states suing over this Obamacare and the senators voted for it. And um, <coughs> you can't change that now. So how, how at this point, are you going to get power back to the states? Uh, there's no popular movement. You can't get people to vote. I mean, uh, Seems like it's almost an impossible task. Right? Okay. Don't you, get the impression that there's enough power okay. to that. You referred to the 17th Amendment? Well, I'm talking about how the senators used to be able to get elected by their own state legislatures. 
instead of popular vote. And yes. now you have people voting senators and they don't even understand the Constitution. And then the senators go to Washington and do all these crazy things. And the states themselves that they represent are suing over the things they voted for. And it seems like there's no reason. It has to start somewhere. Yeah, states have to get their power back somehow. And it seems like that is the start. Well, yes. Um that is the whole idea. That's what the Tenth Amendment Center is about. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, what can I say? Uh, the, the feds have usurped so much power, it's not even funny anymore. Getting it back is going to be difficult. Um, I think the biggest problem is in people's heads, basically. As long as they keep seeing the system is working, they're going to keep supporting it. And many people, you know, they still see our system is working. I mean, you know, I've been overseas. Um, I should mention my wife is from a, a country called Guyana in South America, second poorest country in the hemisphere. If you compare Guyana to the U.S., hey, we live in Disneyland. You know, I mean, we have problems. Yes, we need to change. But on the other hand, it could be worse. Mike. Well, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about the economics that, that keep in the war that most people aren't uh, talking about, and that's the fact that you know our, our currency and its value is artificially propped up because. Uh, well, it's helped to be kept up because of war. Uh, you know, what is our dollar based upon? You know, its fluidity, its uh, standard is the international reserve currency. It's, it's how does it maintain that? Well, I think that's a good point. And um, one of the one theory about why the United States went to war in Iraq that I think is very appealing, at least to me, is that. Uh, Saddam Hussein threatened to start selling oil in euros and then to prop up the dollar the US had to go into Iraq. Um, taking that further, um, not that I like the bomb, but uh, Hugo Chavez down in Venezuela had made the same threat of selling his oil in euros and of course that was back and then in, in 2002 there was a coup attempt against him. So again, I, I, I guess I should settle down about Chavez. I really don't like the guy. <laughs> but anyways, I think the point's made. Well, he demanded um, his gold back. See yeah. that? But he's crazy. At least he's an optimist. There, there, seems, there seems to be a pattern of uh, these countries that want to do something with their oil for their country, and then <laughs> shortly thereafter, something happening in their country. Yeah, like a real <laughs> you know, yeah. 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 A little organized destruction of throwing off that little plan they have to help themselves, basically. Yeah. If, if our dollar is tied to its fluidity, and its fluidity is attached to the oil being traded every day in dollars, you know, then it's to somebody's interest to keep those dollar, all that oil traded in dollars. That's why the money's more water. Well, also, I mean, while, the, while oil is traded in dollars, it's going to be cheaper for us over here. If it ever went over to euros, it would make it easier on the Europeans and make it harder on us. Um, I guess. Um, let me take one more question, then I'm going to wrap up, sir. I was just going to mention, you know, it's, I was thinking back to the uh, what's big storms we had. I think in Vermont, you know, their their National Guard units were missing, right. unable totally to help the people they're supposed to be helping. Yeah. And I was just wondering, are, are there any um, bills in the works that you're aware of to help restore some of this power to the states? No, that's why the Tenth Amendment Center proposed the Defend the Guard legislation. Listen, um, well, all right, quickly, please. Just, I was just pointing out that, if you go to the Tenth Amendment website, I remember seeing that they, either it was Vermont or New Hampshire, had a bill proposed this session or a session ago or something. So. Oh, okay. Cool. All right, one more. Uh, I, I live in Keene, New Hampshire right now with the uh, Free State Project, and, and their solution to it was that yeah. we should get a bear tag, which is a, a, a tank, it's a military assault vehicle, to to aid the, the police department in flood instances so that you know people can be bailed out. Meanwhile, there's like machine gun ports on each door of, of the, the vessel, and they, they try to say that it's not a military vehicle. Homeland Security donated it to the police department for uh, $300,000, but it was totally free, quote unquote, even though you know, yeah. it was paid for with federal tax dollars. Yeah. But, um, they got to they they do something about those dangerous bike riders. <laughs> All right, listen, uh, let me wrap it up. Uh, they, I'm, we're supposed to stop at 5. I'm going to go ahead and uh, plug uh, 
my friend's presentation in the uh, what is it, the Liberty Ballroom. Jim Babb will be speaking about the TSA. So um, I'll see you over there. Thank you. Thank you.